cracking down on dissent or flushing out bad apples. Zimbabwe's government says it's fighting dark forces trying to destabilize the country, but is President Nangagwa just silencing anyone that disagrees with him? I'm Ali Aslan, and today's newsmaker is the crackdown in Zimbabwe. Zimbabweans waited years for Robert Mugabe's reign to end, and when Emerson Nangagwa took power in a coup, he promised change and hope. But for many, not only has he failed to deliver, he may be even more authoritarian than his predecessor. Despite the coronavirus, a mass demonstration was planned last month against government corruption. The organizers and many who took part were swiftly arrested, and now political opposition figures have also been detained. Reports of serious human rights abuses in prison have become common, and the president says he's only detaining a few bad apples intent on dividing the country. But his critics claim he's trying to silence all criticism. For more, here's Natalie Pahonen. On July 31st, the streets of Harare appeared almost deserted, except for a visible security presence. Activists had called on Zimbabweans to take part in demonstrations against corruption and the government's handling of the economy. President Emerson Manangagwa said the protest would amount to insurrection. Despite that declaration, small rallies went ahead. Among those taking part was Fadzai Mahere, the spokesperson for the main opposition party, the Movement for Democratic Change Alliance. She live-streamed her arrest on Facebook. Right police are coming at us and they're armed. Right police are advancing towards us for the, the protest. Mahere was charged with participating in a gathering to incite public violence and breaching coronavirus lockdown regulations. What that arrest represents is the deteriorating human rights situation in Zimbabwe where people are no longer free. And we've known that Zimbabweans are not free, but now if you cannot step outside your home to protest against the national crisis, the hunger crisis, the public health crisis, and the corruption crisis, it, it tells a story. Government critics have come under increasing pressure in Zimbabwe in recent months. Prominent writers, journalists, lawyers, activists, and opposition politicians have been detained. UN human rights experts have called for an end to a pattern of disappearances and torture that appear aimed at suppressing protests and dissent. It's been nearly three years since Manangagwa came to power in a coup that deposed long-term ruler Robert Mugabe. Many Zimbabweans hoped it could lead to a new era of democracy. Manangagwa pledged to revive the economy and take a zero-tolerance approach on corruption. Zimbabweans are still waiting. Inflation is at more than 700%. The cost of basic necessities is getting further out of reach for many, particularly in rural areas. It's estimated that by the end of the year, 60% of the population will be food insecure. Manangagwa says the pandemic, drought, Western sanctions, and the opposition are tampering with growth and prosperity and that there are dark forces inside and outside of the country working against the government. The bad apples that have attempted to divide our people and to weaken our systems will be flushed out. It's a warning that leaves little room for dissent, but more than enough space to crack down on criticism. Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now from Harare is Titi Dangaremba, an author nominated for the Booker Prize. She was arrested during last month anti-corruption protests. And Mordecai Pilot Mashangu is a board chairperson of Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights, which has represented some of those detained, including journalist Hopewell Chinono. We're also hoping that Bride Matonga, who was the Deputy Information Minister on the former President Robert Mugabe, will join us soon. He's having some technical problems at the moment. So we'll hopefully that will be restored. But uh, for the, in the meantime, Titsi, 
uh, glad that you can join us because you were arrested for taking part in the demonstrations against President Nangagwa not too long ago. You're thankfully freed on bail now. What was the reason given to you for your arrest? The charge that was uh, made against me was uh, attending an illegal gathering with intention to incite public violence and breach of the peace and acts of bigotry. You said that your country, that Zimbabwe, is on the verge of imploding. What did you mean by that? What I meant by saying that Zimbabwe is on the verge of imploding is that everything is getting worse. Um, for the last couple of decades, we have seen an erosion in standards of living, in service delivery, um, in the democratic space. And there were many times where Zimbabweans would say it cannot get worse, but we have seen it get worse and it increases too. So at some point, we will reach a point where if we do not arrest this decline, uh, we are going to get into a, a situation of such instability that it will be very difficult to emerge from it. Interestingly enough, uh, former President Robert Mugabe obviously del del delivered many negative headlines internationally as far as his uh, style is concerned. Uh, now with uh, Nangagwa in charge, many people were hoping for a better future for Zimbabwe. That, if I understand you correctly, did not turn out to be. No, um, it didn't turn out to be the case. And I personally am one of the Zimbabweans who is not entirely surprised because the people who are in positions of authority now were also the people who were in positions of authority during the late President Mugabe's uh, rulership of the country. And so it would have been hoping for a lot if they could have made a complete change from the system that they had built up over those 37 years. Um, of course, when one comes into power, one will always paint a rosy picture of what one wants to do. And one may even have intentions of doing it. But if you have a system that is entrenched for 37 years, from 1980 to 2017, and then that system was also in place prior to 1980 as a liberation army, um, then it would be, I think, rather naive to think all of that could be dismantled in a couple of years. Mordecai, these are busy times for you. Sadly, the government is cracking down on government critics. Writers, journalists, lawyers, activists have all been detained uh, for raising their voices against the current administration. What do you make of this? What do you make of the current situation in your country? Um, look, Ali, I think things could be a lot, lot better. I'm, I'm very disappointed at the turn of events myself. Um, and as you rightly point out, our lawyers at Zimbabwe Lawyers Women Rights have been very busy, unusually busy, trying to uh, give as much assistance legally as possible to those who are arrested and detained. And um, yeah, these are not good times, unfortunately. Yeah, indeed. It's uh, quite concerning, especially if we see what the United Nations has to say. They speak of a pattern of disappearances and torture aimed at suppressing protests and dissent. And Human Rights Watch says repression and abuses throughout the country are rampant. Uh, you, of course, as a lawyer at the front lines, are experiencing this firsthand. Yes, yes. Um, I must uh, make a disclaimer here. I'm, I'm actually a commercial lawyer. And uh, I chair Zimbabwe Lawyers Human Rights, and I give them assistance in doing their work. I can say that they are very, very busy. They've never been stretched in this way. And in many ways, it's, um, it's really tragic, really. I mean, I, I would not have thought 40 or so years after independence would still be in this space. Indeed, Sitsi, when Nangagwa came into power, he promised uh, better governance. He, he promised a prospering economy. Uh, the reduction and abolition of corruption, none of these seem to have taken place. How do you explain this? Uh, how did things go bad? When did things take a wrong turn? 
My take on this is that when you are part of a system, you do not really understand all the different aspects of the system that work to make the whole. So a person might come in with the desire to reform, but then you come up against all the parts of the system, and we call them enablers now. So there are a, there's a whole level of society, sector of society, that lives off the system of patronage that the ZANU-PF government has put in place over the last four decades. And so it is not easy to dismantle that because every single person who is um, benefiting from that system of patronage has a vested interest in making sure that the system continues. We were hoping, of course, to have Bright Motonga here, a representative of the government, to join us and uh, answer those allegations, answer to those allegations, because the government, uh, Mordecai, is saying they're merely just flashing out dark forces and bad apples. What do you think they mean by that? Um, no, I, first of all, Ali, I don't share that view at all, actually. Because the, the people that are affected oftentimes are just minding their own business, just going around doing what they have to do to um, earn a living. Uh, and secondly, you know, we have a constitution that allows, you know, demonstrations and protests, as a matter of fact, as long as they are peaceful. And my understanding and the observation I had was that in the main, any of the demonstrations that occurred or that were planned were intended to be peaceful, to convey a message of frustration by the populace. So I, uh, this business of flashing out bad apples, um, I don't buy it, I'm, I'm afraid. I just think that it's an excuse for doing all sorts of things to our own people, which uh, I must confess, horrify me. They really do. And Mordecai, the government is also saying these protests should have never taken place in the times of pandemic, that those are illegal at a time when the government, when the whole world is fighting the coronavirus. People should have never been out. That's the argument made by the government. Uh, what's your response to that? Well, you know, we all understand what you have to do in this time of COVID-19. We have been told repeatedly how to protect ourselves, uh, social or physical distancing, wearing masks and sanitizing. Everybody does that. And you can't demonstrate in social distance. I don't, I don't believe myself that uh, you can shut down a demonstration for that reason. Um, in fact, the interesting thing is that in some of the situations, those who are enforcing the law were themselves not social distancing, some of them not wearing masks. So you'd imagine that if their mission was to prevent people from exposing themselves to this virus, they themselves would be observing the measures that they're trying to implement. So no, I, I'm sorry, I just don't buy it at all. Clearly you are very busy, as we said, uh, helping, providing legal advice to those who have been uh, detained. Do you fear for your own safety and security? Um, no, not really, because you see, Ali, what we are doing is according to the law. We don't violate the laws of the country, we observe them. So if-, if but, it um, seems, but it seems that the law is being applied quite arbitrarily. That's true, that's true. But you know, um, we, we take the view that as long as we are doing what the law permits, acting within the confines of the law, if anything happens, then it's really outside of our control. I mean, you ask me, do I fear for my life? Not really, I don't. I mean, if, if, I, if, if anything happens to me because I'm doing the right thing, well, that's fine, really. I mean, you know, I mean, what can I do? You know, I, we, we have experiences of people who are sitting in their homes minding their own business. You know, we've, we've done applications to try and protect them. So I don't think you need to do anything particularly spectacular to get into trouble in these times, actually. Titi, of course, uh, there seems to be these tactics employed by the government are intended to intimidate people like you in order to silence them. Uh, have they succeeded in your particular case or will you go forward with, uh, for speaking out and, and protesting? In my case, I was responding to the call for the 31st July demonstration. And it was clear that most of the citizenry has uh, grievances that they want to express. And so that was a very specific uh, issue for me. 
The question then becomes, has anything changed? Has the situation improved since then? And I would say, no, the situation has not improved. It has become worse because we see people continuing to be arrested on the, for the most arbitrary reasons, 22-year-old young women being arrested for undermining the authority of the president as a result of something written on Facebook and spending a night in police cells. And so we see that the situation is not improving. Um, several people, especially from the NDCA, the opposition, are in hiding as we speak. And so it would be remiss of me as a citizen not to express what I feel is wrong. As long as I do it within the law, I am not inciting violence. I am engaging peacefully and pointing the country in a better way for all citizens. So it will be difficult to silence me, but I must reiterate that uh, my engagement is always peaceful, it's always positive, and it's always inclusive of anybody who want, wants to engage. Citizens have a right to express their needs and their views as a way of engaging and shaping the way they are governed. Um, it is not correct for citizens to be told, you have to sit and keep quiet and we can do whatever we want. So as far as I'm concerned, it's important to keep citizen expression continuing. And that expression is more than legitimate if we are looking at the economic numbers that are coming out of Zimbabwe, obviously hyperinflation, we, people are experiencing food shortages, corruption is uh, rampant. So there's a reality, the economic reality on the ground seems quite dismal, Titi. It is, absolutely, because we have an economic crisis. Uh, a lot of it is to do with manipulation of the currency. Uh, so we have a parallel market and the prices there uh, do not reflect uh, what is said to be the real value of the currency. So there's a big discrepancy. Um, industry is unable to operate optimally in those conditions, and so pr productivity is very low. Um, basic foodstuffs are very difficult to obtain. Most of our economy is now informal. Uh, some observers say that it's up to 80% informal. Now, the COVID-19 regulations impact very formidably on the informal sector. And so a great section of the population is not able to pursue its, uh, to earn its living in the way that it needs to. The health system has also collapsed. And strangely enough, COVID-19 has made the health system deliver worse rather than better because uh, many institutions require a COVID-19 certificate before you can get, before you can be admitted. Um, the education system is in shambles. Countries that have better infrastructure um, are using the internet for education. Zimbabwe does not have that option. And in some cases, even radio does not uh, go um, reach the whole country. And then again, uh, the teachers are often on strike because they cite incapacitation due to poor wages. They do not have a living wage. Um, service delivery is getting increasingly bad, whether it's water delivery, whether it's power, whether it's transport, whether it's fuel. And so the citizens really are in crisis and they need to be able to speak to that. Mordecai, the government is acknowledging the dismal economic situation. However, it is blaming the pandemic, the drought. It is uh, blaming Western sanctions. All of those legitimate or just an excuse? No. Well, I, I do believe they're largely excuses, really. I mean, we can go through them one by one. I mean, the sanctions that they talk about, we really know they're not real sanctions, uh, and they're not the cause of the problem. Our biggest problem, Ali, really, is corruption. Corruption sucks so much money out of the national purse, and if that was plugged, our story would be different. In fact, I was just reflecting on this started a long time ago, 1982. That's when we had our first real case of corruption, which had to do with the drought and the, you know, the, the way the, the government bought grain to feed the people. And there was massive corruption. And the minister responsible just did not get uh, punished or called to account. Is corruption, is corruption as bad or even worse than it was under Mugabe? 
Well, it's difficult to say that. I think the comment I would make, which I can make, I think, uh, confidently, is that the scale of corruption has always been high in Zimbabwe. The problem is that it's not really seriously dealt with. You know, I take a view that every country has to deal with corruption in one way or another. But in our situation, we have not really addressed it. You get reports of corruption, some confirmed, and you don't see anybody being punished for it. So it actually encourages it to, to carry on. But the price of corruption is very high. In my view, it accounts for most of our problems. All the other things you talk about, even droughts, there are droughts everywhere else, and people can cope with them because they are prepared to deal with them. But where you know you have undermined the economy to the extent that we have, then you can't even handle simple problems. I mean, COVID is another example. I mean, you, you, you've heard reports of how attempts were made to suck money out of the system on the pretext of uh, dealing with COVID. So right. yeah, these problems, unfortunately, just carry on. Right. Uh, I see that uh, technically you're up now and you're uh, joining us. Uh, glad to have you because for, uh, throughout the show, both uh, Sisi and Mordecai have complained of the crackdown uh, that uh, the government has imposed on its critics, saying it's unjustified. Uh, what's your response? Okay, I've just been told that we lost them again. So uh, it's not meant to be, but Sisi... After everything that you have described uh, of the dismal situation, both you and Mordecai, what is the way out? What is the solution then that you are proposing? I think the solution is that people must remain resolute in continuing to express their situation and to make it clear that this is not acceptable, that a government that engages in such a way with the population is a government that is putting itself in a situation where its legitimacy can be questioned. Because there is no people in the world that elects a government to rule badly to the extent of destroying the economy, disregarding the constitution, disregarding the social contract, and setting the military onto the people. There is no population in the world that says, come and do these things to us. Are you hopeful, so are you hopeful our... that this renewal can come from within, or are you hoping for some international engagement here, the African Union perhaps? Uh, what are you hoping for? We will need both internal and external engagement because the Zimbabwean population is incapacitated by these years of decline and we do not really have the resources to make sufficient pressure. So we need high level pressure that is commensurate with the state level um, to assist us in that. But the first mover has to be the Zimbabwean people. We cannot expect people to come from outside when we are not able to express ourselves and take our position within the country. Mordecai, what is your vision? If you had a blueprint, what would be your vision for the future of Zimbabwe and how to achieve it? It's very difficult. Um, the answers are obvious, but implementing them is a, is a problem. Um, let me also say that at Zimbabwe Lawyers Women Rights, we don't prescribe solutions as such. And I admire Tsitsi and her activities, activism. We, we really provide something of a palliative to uh, lessen the burden and the pain that people feel. As far as the solution is concerned, look, um, let's go back to 2009, when Zimbabwe had a unity government. Think of how that came about. It came about because our neighbors said, look, enough is enough. You can't carry on doing this. They put sufficient pressure on those in power at the time to bring them together so that they had a common purpose. And we began to make progress. Unfortunately, in 2013, that was rolled back and we receded back to where we were. So I agree with Titi that it's a combination of what we do within the country, persuading our government to do the right thing. And those who care about us from out there also, you know, applying their own entreaties to help us uh, move in the right direction. Well, Titi and Mordecai, thank you so much for joining us and thank you so much for the insights that you have provided about the situation in your country in Zimbabwe. Thank you so much for that. And thank you out there for watching. This wraps up another edition of Newsmakers. Hope to see you again next time.